Um, what I wanted to do next is connect this notion of cross product with the with normal vectors we had talked about before. So it 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 justifies rehearsing a little bit about our discussion of M flats that we had talked about before. So an M flat or a coset or an affine set, there's a lot of different names for these things. But an M flat, remember, an M flat is a, is a set of vectors in our vector space, which here is Fn. It's a set of vectors in Fn that looks just like Fm. Um, it, it'll just look like an isomorphic, a congruent copy of Fm there. And so there's two ways of describing flats that we've talked about. Uh, there's one approach which we call the bottom-up uh, approach. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the bottom-up approach is about using M linearly independent spanning vectors. So the key behind the bottom-up approach is we span uh, to make our space right there. So kind of like we saw previously, if we have two, maybe like two vectors, here's V1 and some other vector V2. If these things are independent, then they come together and form a span. These two vectors would form a plane. And the flat, which a uh, plane is just a two flat, of course, uh, would give us every, every point you could reach using just these two vectors and it forms a plane. <coughs> Excuse me again. And so we can describe this, uh, we can describe either the plane or general flats by a vector equation here where X on the left-hand side is, is our variable. Uh, so a vector X would be formed by some particular vector on the plane or the flat, whatever it is. And then we have our spanners, V1, V2, up to Vn. We have these spanners. Those are all fixed. Uh, our variables are going to be these parameters, C1, C2, Cm. These are coefficients and also X on the other side. And so these parameters are usually, are, this is what we mean when we talk about parametric equations. parametric equations. This is one way of describing a flat. Okay, we use these parametric equations. And so that's this bottom-up approach. We just keep on adding, uh, like if we want to, if we want like a 12-dimensional flat, what we do is we add one spanning vector, then a second one, then a third one, then a fifth, a fourth one, fifth one, all the way up to 12, each time making sure we add something that's linearly independent to what we had before. Uh, the top-down approach, on the other hand, uh, we can we can take this situation uh, by taking n minus m, so that's the difference between the ambient dimension and the dimension of the flat here. We take the difference of n minus n linearly independent normal vectors, n1, n2, up to n, n minus m. And so the, ki the critical thing here is that we are taking not spanners, but we're taking normal vectors this time. And we don't define a vector equation, we get a system of scalar equations. And those scalar equations are going to look like this equation ni uh, dot x, uh, x minus x naught right here. This equals zero, the zero vector. Uh, I'm sorry, that's just zero, the zero scalar. So this is what we mean by these scalar equations, which when expanded, expanded out will look like uh, this bad boy right here. We can put it in this normal form. And so this time around, if we have our flat like so, the idea is can we describe the flat using normal vectors? Can we take vectors which are orthogonal, which are perpendicular to the space in question? So if you're talking about a plane in, um, in three-dimensional space, then you need one vector to describe it. On the other hand, if your flat is like a line, then you're going to have to have two independent normal vectors to describe it. So maybe like one like this. Like, for example, if you take the white line to be your x-axis, then we're taking the normal vectors, uh, the z-axis and the y-axis, to describe that line in terms of normal vectors there. All right? And so you can describe, uh, you can describe the, the space using normal vectors by this linear equation right here. You take the normal vector dot x minus x naught, and so the dot product, since they're orthogonal, should be zero. And then you can derive a scalar equation from that. So that's just a rehearsal of those up, uh, top, down, bottom, up approach to describing the same flat. And much of linear algebra is, is uh, the process of transitioning from one representation to another. Like one representation we do all the time is we go from the top to the bottom. And how do we do that? 
Uh, so if you're if you describe a flat using the top down approach, the idea is it is this matrix equation, a x equals b, which of course we can think of that as an augmented matrix a augment b, and then we go about row reducing that thing. A will then turn into some echelon form U, and then we have some vector Y right here, which is whatever the right-hand side turned into. And so then from there, it's like, okay, if I wanna write the general solution to this, I look at this matrix U right here, and you're gonna calculate uh, some basis, some basis for the null space of U, which of course is the same thing as the null space of A, since A and U are row equivalent. And then uh, from this vector Y, we pull out some particular vector X naught uh, that's on the space right there. And so then you get this combination where X equals some X naught plus you know C1 times the first spanner plus C2 times the second spanner, and you continue on. This gives you the parametric equations for the solution set there. This one we've done to death. I don't want to say much more about that right now. Um, what I want to talk about is actually how do we do, how do, what happens if we start off with the bottom up approach and we want to switch it to the top down? Did I never write top down here? Whoops. We want to switch it to the top down approach. That is, what if we have an answer to the problem, but we don't have the problem yet? Uh, if we have a, the parametric equations for some flat, can I come up with a system of linear equations that solves that? So in particular, uh, we start off with this vector equation right here, x equals x naught plus c1, v1 plus c2, v2, all up to cm, vn. So what we want is we want to find an equation that looks like ax equals b. So how do we find a? Well, the thing we know about a is that the null space of a we know what its span is supposed to be. Because we have the bottom-up approach, we know the spanners of this. So we know the basis. We have the basis for A's null space. Can we build A from that? Well, one thing to notice here is that the, no, the null space and the row space are related to each other. If we take the orthogonal complement of the, of the null space, that gives us the row space of A. And so what we want to do is we want to look for a matrix B so that the row space of B uh, is equal to the null space of A. And why we care about that is if we take, um, if we take uh, the, the orthogonal complements of these things, that then gives us that the orthogonal complement of the row space of B, which is none other than the null space of B, this would equal the row space of A, which of course is the orthogonal complement of the null space of A, like so. So we're gonna look for a matrix B so that, uh, let me highlight it right here. We wanna find a matrix B so whose row space is equal to the null space of A. So we're gonna set up a matrix whose rows co coincide with the spanners right here. And then from that we can construct uh, the normal vectors. I think this one might be a little bit better to explain via an example because uh, we haven't done a whole lot of this so far. So let's say we are in R2 and we are looking for, uh, we're in R2 and we're going to construct a two flat, aka a plane, a plane uh, whose equation is given right here. And we can specify those things a little bit. So we're looking for, uh, we're looking for the equation X so that you get the vector one, two, three, four. So that, that's a vector that is on the flat, it's on the plane. Um, then you'll have some, some spanners there, S times the vector one, zero, zero, negative one, plus T times the vector two, one, negative three, zero, like so. So in a more expanded form, that's what this vector equation looks like right here, all right? And so what we want to do is we want to find a linear system of equations whose solution is whose general solution is this right here. So we want to find ax equals b so that this right here is your solution. All right? And so what I claim to do is we want to build a matrix b whose null whose row space is equal to the null space of the matrix a. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these two spanning vectors. We're going to take u 
whose, in, whose entries are one, zero, zero, negative one, that becomes the first row of B. And then the second row is just the second vector V, two, one, negative three, uh, and zero right there. So that part's gonna be basically the exact same. And so you'll notice here, the way that we've set this thing up is that the row, the rows of B span the null space of A. So we have that correspondence. That's what we wanna do. So then row reduce that matrix. I'm not gonna give you all the details of that, but let's row reduce that matrix B. If you row reduce B, um, you're gonna get pivots in the first column and the second column, and then the others are where they are. Uh, so you see that you're gonna get these two uh, free variables, free variables showing up in uh, the third and fourth column. So we can build uh, a basis for the, we can build a basis for the null space of B. And if we do that, remember, we're gonna get a one in the three spot, since there's gonna be one vector associated to the third variable. And then we're gonna get a one in the fourth spot because there's again, uh, there's gonna be a spanning vector associated to the, to the, to the, the fourth variable, which is free. And then looking at, of course, the first row right here, you take the negations, you're gonna get zero and one. And then looking at the second row, you're gonna get three and two. So this gives us a basis for the null space of A, uh, the null space of B. Now the significance of this is that the null space is orthogonal to the row space. And since the row space of B is the null space of A, then when we take the orthogonal complement of the row space of B, which we know how to do, this will give us the orthogonal complement to the null space of A, which is the row space of A. So this right here, this span, these two vectors span the row space uh, of our matrix A right here. And so if that gives us, if that gives us the row space of A, right? We should be thinking of these as row vectors, right? Uh, we're gonna get that A is the matrix where we can plug in 0, 3, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. That's the matrix one, or the matrix A, excuse me. So that's the first part, right? We're trying to find this matrix AX equals B. Uh, how do we figure out the B? Well, we could we we could figure it out from here, but another approach that works really great here is that these vectors right here you can think of as the normal vectors. So this is n, n1, this is n2. These are the normal vectors to the to the plane that we're trying to construct. And so what we can do is we're going to take n1 dot uh, the vectors we started off with are spanning vectors. So we take u minus x naught that equals zero. And then we're gonna take n2 dot v minus x naught, which gives us zero right here. And if we expand these things, um, we take the dot products here. You take n1, you're gonna get zero times, remember u, it can't see it on the screen right now, but u uh, was the vector, we'll write it over here, just so we can remember it. U, remember, was the vector one, uh, what, what was it again? One, zero, zero, negative one and V was the vector uh, two, one, negative three, zero. And then X naught was the vector one, two, three, four. That's a fun one to remember. But anyways, so if you use those, if you take the dot product of N one with these things, you're gonna get zero times one minus one, plus uh, you're gonna get the second entry of N one, which is a three times zero minus two. Uh, then we get one times zero minus three. And then lastly, you're gonna get zero times, uh, where did it go? U was a negative one minus four, like so. And this should all equal zero. Uh, that one simplifies dramatically, of course. Uh, you're gonna end up with, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what did I do here? Uh, I put in specific entries uh, for U and V. We don't wanna do that already, I'm sorry. Uh, ooh, JK, everyone. Uh, the issue here is we already took care of the U and the V. We don't need that. Uh, we want X to be a generic vector, a generic vector for the plane. So we're gonna have an X1 right here, an X2 right here, an X3 right here, and then an X4 right here. And so when you simplify that equation, you're gonna end up with three X2 minus six plus X3 minus three, 
is equal to zero. Uh, setting, uh, setting the right-hand side, uh, moving all the constants to the right-hand side, you get 3x2 plus x3 equals a positive 9. And so this is going to give us our first equation in our system of equations. You'll notice that the coefficients of the variables are exactly what we said they were going to be before, 0, 3, 1, and 0. Okay? And then so for the second one, what we want to do is we want to take n2 dot x minus x naught. This should equal 0. And so n2, remember what it was, n2 was 1, 2, 0, 1. So you're going to get 1 times x minus 1 uh, plus 2. And I should say this was x1, x2 minus 2. And then the next entry was a 0, x3 minus 3, plus the last entry of n2 was a 1, x4 minus 4. This should all equal 0. And so simplifying this thing, we end up with x1 minus 1, plus 2x2 minus 4, plus 0, plus x4 minus 4 equals 0. If we move all the constants to the other side, we get x1 plus 2x2 plus x4 equals, uh, when we move everything to the other side, we should get a plus 9, like so. And so if we put all this together, if we take the two observations we made, because uh, this would be our second equation right here, we now have a system of equations, uh, which looks like 3x2 plus x3 equals 9. And then we also have x1 plus 2x2 plus uh, x4. We'll put the plus right there. And that equals 9 as well. So we now have, we found a linear system of equations whose solution set will be the, the plane in our four that we had talked about before. And so what, what does this have to do with a cross product right here? Uh, well, this, this problem itself doesn't. What we did is we took, we, we took, we know the spinning vectors for the flat and we're trying to find the normal vectors of the flat. And then we could describe using the, the system, using that, those normal vectors instead of the spanning vectors. Um, I want you to be aware that if we're talking about a hyperplane, in the case of a hyperplane, so a hyperplane is when the dimension between the space and the flat is only difference by one. In a hyperplane situation, you only have to find one of these linear equations. Basically, the determinant approach we talked about before could be used, in particular in R3, we can use the cross product to do this exact same process. So consider we want to find the equation of a plane in R3 that passes through the following three points. Well, pick one of the points to be your x naught. It really doesn't matter which one you pick. So I'm going to try to pick the one which I think has easier coefficients. Uh, so I'm going to take negative 1, 0, 1 as my x naught. Once you have x naught, your spanning vectors u will, will be by taking one of the other points and subtracting the x naught from it. So we take the 1, negative 2, 1, subtract x naught from it. So negative 1, 0, 1. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. Of course, we end up with 2, negative 2, and 0. And then for v here, we do the same thing, but take the other vector, 3, 2, 0, and then subtract from your x naught, uh, like so. And so when you take that difference, we end up with a 4, a 2, and a negative 1. And so these gives us our spanning vectors. So these vectors right here... These vectors right here give you your spanners. They give you the spanning vectors for the flat. What we want to do to describe the plane, to find an equation for the plane, uh, we need a scalar equation. We need to know the normal vector. So what normal vector can we use to describe these things? Well, if we're looking for normal vectors, we could do what we did on the previous example, or we could try to use cross products or determinants to define uh, that to that, that normal vector. Our normal vector n is going to be u cross v, like we said before. The cross product is equal to, it's, it'll be orthogonal to the first two vectors. So we can calculate that as e1, e2, e3, uh, 1, negative 2, 1, and then 3, 2, 0, like so.
we can calculate uh, it in that fashion. Now, one little trick I want to talk about when it comes to three three determinants, this one shows up a lot. And we ever, I don't think we've talked about it in this lecture series here, is we could cofactor expand across the first column. That gives us the definition. We could try cofactoring across a different column or row, right? We could do that one since there is a zero after here. There's a little bit of benefit of doing that. Um, and the fact that we have an E1, E2, E3 doesn't really change the fact that we can do those different uh, rows or columns if we want to. But another way of sort of uh, handling this three by three determinant, one that kind of mimics the two by two case, right? If you have A, B, C, D, we often draw these slashes and things like that. Um, I wanna give you something that works a lot that for three by three determinants. Um, if you take, um, if you take uh, your matrix, and, and maybe this isn't the best example, maybe, maybe I'll do a short video to, I'll just do another video uh, and show you how to do that in just a second. Uh, but if we were to cofactor expand across this row, I mostly just want to pause because I want to finish up this lecture so it doesn't get too long for everyone here. But if we cofactor expand, uh, we're going to get 0 minus 2 times E1. We're going to get minus uh, 0 minus 3 times E2. And then you're going to get plus uh, 2 plus 6 times E3. You notice when you think of this as determinants, we can get these calculations really quickly. And so you end up with the vector negative 2, uh, positive 3, and 8 as our normal vector right there. Uh, let's see. I think I made a miscalculation somewhere. Uh, where did I do it? Uh, negative 2. Yeah, there is a problem there. I, apparently I went too fast. Did I write down my numbers correctly from before? Uh, oh, I think I did. I did. I wrote down the wrong columns in the determinant. Whoopsie daisy. Let me let me fix that. Sorry, I wrote down the points on I wrote down the points on the plane. I didn't write down the spanning vectors, uh, which were these ones to the right over here. Uh, there goes my hope of trying to make this thing short. Two, negative two, and zero. Uh, four, two, and negative one. Let's try these again. Uh, so if we do the determinants this time, uh, we end up with two minus zero times E1, and then we're going to go minus uh, negative 2 plus 0 that time, E2, and then finally we're going to end up with 4 plus 8, E3, like so, and so we end up with the vector 2, 2, and 12, like so. All right, so this, this is our normal vector n. And so once we have the normal vector n, we then will take n dot x minus x naught. This should equal zero. And if we work through this thing, we end up with two times x minus, I guess it should be a plus one, shouldn't it? Because that was our x naught. Uh, then we get two times y minus x naught has a zero right there. And then finally we get uh, plus 12 times z minus 1 is equal 0. And so when you distribute things through, you get 2x plus 2y plus 12z. Uh, and then on the other side, you're going to get a negative 2 uh, plus 0 plus 12, which is 14. I can't help but notice everything in that, and all the coefficients here are even. If you divide everything by 2, you get the equation x plus y plus 6z equals 7. And this then gives us, uh, should I got 7 right there? And in my notes, I got a 5. Let me double check my arithmetic. Ooh, apparently this lecture's gone on too long since I'm making too many mistakes along the way. Um, uh, so let's see, we had a 2. So we distribute this over here. That's going to be a negative 2. Uh, that's a positive 2, which when you switch it to the other side gives you a negative 2. I'm good with that. And um, I'm good with that. There was a 0 right here. So when you times that by 2, you get nothing. And so then you get 12 when it goes right here. Um, that should be 12 and 1. That should be 12. So you move to the other side of the equation. You should get a negative 2 and a 12. Oh, I guess that's my issue there. I did 2 plus 12. Um, sorry about that. Probably people in the in the in the watching the video notice this much quicker than I did. But twelve take away two is a ten, and so then the should have a five right here. 
All right, and so that gives us the equation for that plane in R3, and we calculate the normal vector using cross products. Do you have to use cross products to find normal vectors? Absolutely not. Can you? Sure, sure, it can be helpful. Um, and so when you can, when you're in R3, feel free to use cross products All uh, you can, or use determinants, although I think the, the approach in the previous example probably works a little bit better in general here. So um, thanks for watching this video. Um, it was a little bit of a long one this time. Sorry about that. Uh, but thanks for watching anyways. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, feel free to subscribe and like this video if you like to see these things and want to see some more of them in the future. And I will see you next time. Bye, everyone.